Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women's Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. I'm so committed to centering black women, girls, and femmes in sewing that when I read the name Harlem Needle Arts Project, I was already in. I was already interested and excited and captivated. And the more I learned, I went to a couple of Mantra Mondays that they hosted on Zoom and following them on Instagram. Some really beautiful, evocative projects that both speak to needs of creativity as well as community. So I am honored to be able to speak today with Michelle Bishop. Welcome to the program, Michelle. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am delighted that you have been inspired by us and have had the opportunity to engage with us through our Mantra Mondays. It's a wonderful project as a whole. Like just going through your Instagram feed, you get a really beautiful feeling for what you are about. But can you tell us a little bit about your background, Michelle, and then we can transition to talk about why you started Harlem Needle Arts. Sure. I am, um, you know, I guess from a professional point of view, my background is database development. And so I manipulate data. I've always been a person who has been committed to who I am culturally. My family's from Barbados and I, I lived there for a little bit. And I was always inspired by my aunt, my aunt, Auntie Jean, as you know, she's known to us who was, you know, one of the original boss ladies in my life. And she, at 16 years old, uh, was not going off to to England to become a nurse, like some of the other, some of her other family members and peers. And she didn't want to do laundry for white people. So she decided she was going to take a class in sewing. And she went to, you know, I don't know who was teaching it at that time. And she took a sewing class. She saved up enough money to buy a sewing machine. And that original sewing machine still exists. And she sewed everything she could sew. She started out doing school uniforms and dresses. And um, then she br- did bridal stuff and everything that you can think of. She had a small gift shop in a hotel. And then she decided she wasn't going to do as much clothing, but deal with more home interior. So she does or did reupholstery, curtains, bedding, tablecloths, all those different types of things for personal homes as well as hotels. And she did that up until about um, probably about six years now. She sadly had a stroke, but she's still with us. It's just that she can't work. Um, but her original sewing machine is, is still in her house and she had a motor put on it many years ago and she is the original boss for me. And she, that's one of my inspirations in starting Harlem Needle Arts, you know, coming out of a background of using my database development. It's a tool for any business. First of all, it's how you manipulate your data and your content to reach people or to affect something. And so I worked for many years, um, most recent profession outside of what I do now for a special events company. And I wore Mm. three different hats. Um, I designed their custom databases for all their events and um, Manage their local area network and uh, what else? And also, I was part of the being an account executive for actually raising funds. So I got to see the business firsthand from all avenues. And I knew that I wanted to sort of be on my yes. own while I was there. I, yeah, I, I knew that. And I started to build Harlem Needle Arts probably in about 2003, 2004. Um, 
I always, I'm always <laughs> selling something. So let's say always selling something, you know, from er- my earliest years back in the day. Well, first of all, I was a Girl Scout. And then, the, you know, you would get magazines yes. like Write On Magazine or yes. all of those magazines. And in the back, they would have all these little tiny ads. And I, there was an ad where you could get stuff and all you had to do was sell greeting cards. And I sent away for that and I started selling greeting cards. It was like holiday Christmas cards where you would take an order for that person and their name, the family's name would be printed in the card. And the more cards you sold, you got to select different prizes. So I would hustle that every holiday season and I was always doing something, involved in something. School, very active, you know, went on to Pace University, worked in both, you know, private and yes. nonprofit industry, and um, always committed, like I said, to just always connected to who I was culturally. My, my friend and I had a, a, a business called... Oh God! Wow, rhythm of that's life for you. Another great name. And what? Wow, yeah, that's another great name. <laughs> yes, and what we did is we sold um, cultural accessories, and this is back in you know late eighties, early nineties, at many of the cultural festivals, you know, from D.C., Maryland area, to here in New York, the what's net, well, it was called the African Street Festival. It's now called the International yes, African Art Festival. I saw some of those images. Dance after on your Instagram page, and I was like, on your Instagram page, and I was like, oh my god. Yeah, it's not happening. None of the festivals are happening this season. So, Dance Africa, International African Art Festival. I don't know if Odunde will happen either. Probably not. That's in Philly. Um, we did so many festivals and you know that was it was a time where you know you didn't have a credit card machine outside of course we both had nine to five jobs but you had more energy you were single you you got out there and you were always we were always on the grind and so professionally I just kind of morphed from what I was doing and built Harlem Needle Arts because Um, initially it was, I was looking in Harlem for some place for my mother to take crochet classes. I thought, yeah, I thought it was best that she learned from someone other than me because, you know, there's just, there's a level of, you know, being more receptive sometimes when it's outside Mm -hmm. of the family in any event, couldn't find any place in practically in Manhattan that even taught crochet or knitting and then um so I I thought about that and then I said hmm I should host a class I'm sure other people would want to learn um the other inspiration for it is that I was a member well still a member um not an active member but of Harlem Girls Quilting Circle and yeah and my friend Ife Felix organized a only a one day workshop and she was teaching how to quilt and there were like pro- i don't know maybe 25 women that took this workshop we had a whole day workshop here in Harlem we loved it so much everyone wanted to continue on so it became a gathering of of sisters who we would take turns hosting the meeting at our homes and Then that got into me curating because we were producing content. And I said, well, well, someone approached one of the members who's an artist, Laura Gadsden. We did a small exhibit at her home of the work we had produced. And someone she knew said, you should, you know, your work should be at Avery Fisher Hall. And she was like, what does that, what does that entail? So at the time, Avery Fisher Hall was a part of the Lincoln Center campus. And yeah. And so that's one of the pieces, the, one of the properties that's part of Lincoln Center. It is no longer called Avery Fisher Hall. 
it's now called the David Giffen Center for something. Anyway, so that particular hall had on their lower level uh, what's called the Cork Gallery. And you could, what they would do is they would invite artists to come in and they, you would have to install your own work, do your own, sit the exhibit yourself Mm -hmm. and exhibit your work. And Mm -hmm. so Laura followed up with that. And then between she and I, we curated uh, the second exhibit there. And then that every year it was, once again, me being a data person, It's organizing the content from each person, images, text, um, promotional material, um, signage, on and on and on. So I took on that role in the group. And so for me, looking at being in all these cultural spaces and saying, well, the world needs to know about everyone, you know, it needs to know about the art and not solely the art end, but the art and cultural lens of all of the different forms of needle arts. And there were so many people around me that were in the artistic world on a more localized yeah. level at the time. Um, yeah. They needed spaces to be seen. And I, I, I didn't see that at all. So I seized the opportunity to sort of meet the unmet demand. I think that's what that saying said. And I started to do research and started, I already, you know, was able to market and seek out media attention and all of that from all the different jobs that I've had. I've never had a a really a job that was just one job. It was always three jobs, you know, marketing, database, fundraising, you know, um, research, um, I never really not, you know, as I sit here and think about it, I never really had a one job within any of the institutions, organizations, companies that I've worked for. And so those skills, all of those skills are transferable. And I transferred them and started Harlem Needle Arts. I launched a crochet workshop. It wasn't called Harlem Needle Arts at the time. It was more of Michelle is doing this. Come through. Let's work together. Um, sent out an email. This is before Facebook and Instagram and all of those social media tools. And people came from all over. They sent in the registration form, sent in their payment. We, I rented a space. We had a workshop. Once again, people enjoyed it. They want to do something different. They want to continue on. And that continued In 2005, I said, I have to, I need to sort of register this as a business. And I decided on the name Harlem Needle Arts. We incorporated in 2005 and I was still working nine to five. Still, you know, my daughter was in middle school um, and I decided, things sort of came to me. I can't remember how I was connected with Columbia University. They have a, um, in their law school, they have a a partnership with people who are interested in starting businesses for profit or nonprofit. And so they will partner you with, um, um, I guess, I don't know what, what, what seniors in law school, whatever that year in law school, third third year students. And they would partner you with two students and one advisor. And I worked with them to begin to, you know, create the paperwork to actually become a nonprofit. That's wonderful. Yeah. And they graduated. And so the paperwork was 80% completed. And I was still kind of mulling it over. Like, what, what does this really mean? And in taking that time to mull over, one of the students that following, so they graduated in May, that following September, um, her name is Elizabeth, and she called me and says, I'm working for this huge, you know, international firm, and they do pro bono work. Where oh are you in goodness. your paperwork? And so that said to me, that's a sign, you know, go ahead, get this finished. And by that December, 
the IRS certified us a nonprofit arts and cultural organization with, um, so our mission is we preserve fiber textile design and needle arts in the African diaspora. And through the means of workshops, exhibitions, technical support to artists, economic development for artists, um, we are the gamut in terms of providing to both our general constituents, the general public, as well as the artists in our network and beyond our network. Michelle, your story is such a powerful revelation. I mean, just the story of how you began this project based on a personal need, just something as small as you wanted your mother to learn crochet, or maybe your mother wanted to learn crochet, but you figured that, yes, you might have taught other mm-hmm. people, but sometimes it can be better for, um, you know, for someone else to teach a family member. And, you know, and then you were like, okay, let me look around and see what I can find. I can't find anything. Therefore, this is a need that I can fill. And you did it. And it's right. such, I, I, I think a lot about possibility models that's something that's really important for my own um, practice with Black Women Stitch. Like when I started this group, it was very, it was a bit difficult because I hadn't, I hadn't, I'd seen a few other people do something, but it wasn't exactly this. And I also knew what mm-hmm. I needed and I couldn't find what I needed. I saw that there were these amazing groups. And so I was able to look at models from the Yarn Mission, for example, was a great model. Another model that I looked at was the Social Justice Sewing Academy. That was a great model. And so both of those groups were like, look, they can do it, Lisa. They are doing it and you can do it too. And I don't know, I think, I don't know if it's, I don't know why we sometimes talk ourselves out of things, um, you know, rather than talking ourselves into things. Or at least just speaking for myself, I, you know, Mm -hmm. it took me a while to think that I could do any of this, but I had possibility models, even the podcast, you know, I love this podcast called Tea with Queen and Jay, um, and they're based out of New York, and they had a podcast event, and I didn't even have a podcast, I just went, Um, they had it at this place a little bit adjacent to the West Village. I don't know much about New York geography, but I went and it was a great time. Mm -hmm. And then I met some other women of color, black women podcasters. And then four months later, I had a podcast, you know? And so like, it's these types of things that your organization is such a beacon for. I mean, you help me because I follow your newsletter and that's how I found out about this arts organization that's giving out grants for the next few months. And so I put my name on the list. I mean, it was just things mm-hmm. like that, like these small things that might not seem like um, significant actions individually, but just when you think about the cumulative effect that your work has had overall, I really hope that you recognize like how much of an amazing cultural shift you are helping to bring about and precipitate uh, because you are absolutely bringing that shift about by um, by normalizing and providing a model for what it means to center ourselves in in a variety of craft spaces yes. where we find ourselves erased. Right. And I, I'm the person who is pro-Black, yes. okay, mm-hmm. pro-African, pro-African diaspora, and I am not, I'm not the person that says I'm doing this because they're doing it. This is not a comparison, right? This is a, I create opportunities through this particular model institution um, that represents who we are. And it's there for all the entire world to see, but we are about the African diaspora and people of color and indigenous communities as well. And teaching and learning, engaging, understanding similarities, understanding cultural connections. And that is critical. And I, it's not just, you know, recently there was a a media opportunity for us and this media group said, oh, this pastime X, Y, and Z. Oh, my goodness. And I, so I had to clarify that. I clarify. 
pastime. So I clarified. I said, well, so these are the talking points, right? And please understand what this represents for who we are. Now, yes, you can have, you can be a hobbyist and engaged in all the different art forms, and that's totally relevant and fine. But from the angle in which this interview was related to, it, the, we were working with artists, right? And once again, the world doesn't see, not all of the world, let me not be so general. Um, some in the world don't see the art forms of quilting, adire, batik, weaving, spinning, all of these different entities as artistic or things that are related to cultural artifacts. And they think of them very utilitarian and very um, Americana. Americana. Yes, kinda yes. Americana. They see it as, um, oh, as more, more craft uh, than art. Right, right. And so, and there's a balance in those worlds, right? And if we look at who we are culturally, and if you look at some of the major art institutions in the world, many of those institutions have an African art collection. And those col in those collections in are included cultural artifacts, which in many cases represent something that was often constructed by some form of thread. Right. That means your mass. dress, your attire, your, your mass, your ceremonial pieces. And so those are artifacts. Those are who we are. But the stitching, the hand, that has always been something a part of who we are, our existence. And it's been, you know, as my friend Camille says, you are born when you are born, you are wrapped yes. in cloth in most cultures. And when you have died, when you die, you're wrapped in cloth. And so what between birth and death, what happens between the construction of fiber through ceremonies and rituals and, you know, culturally, all of these aspects of who we are, there's always been a significant passage, rites of passage that includes the, the the structure of creating something through textile slash thread in in who we are culturally. And that is not always seen, like I said, from an artistic point of view. Um, but I can go down the a list of, you know, so many artists that are working in textile or have been working in textile for years. Um, how has it been taken seriously over the years? Where is it now? Um, back when I was starting Harlow Needle Arts, there is an author, Kyra Hicks, who wrote the book yes. Black Threads. And I read that book from cover to cover. Now, some people may think I'm a little bit insane because it's most, mostly it's statistical information. And it's, it's data, right, about who is spending money in this industry. So when I have to, and, and, and what, what are the frames of this, so as they call it a pastime, it's far more than that. It's far more than a pastime. These are artists working in this frame, um, here, understand the language. People think of quilting. They have no clue. Oh the my layers gosh, of you are that. so right. You know, there's people out uh, there in the world that keep calling quilts blankets. Um, which makes me always want to throttle someone. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's it, at this very moment, probably from an educate, from an artistic educational point of view, this type of art is not necessarily included right. in the textbooks, let's say. Right. And so at what point will it be included? I don't know. I, I, in some cases, some textbooks are becoming obsolete. Then that means, and I spoke to a professor a few years ago, and he said from his knowledge base, what he does is he goes after what he already knows is out there that's not included in textbooks. So he then is able to share information about artists, either from, you know, a media, you know, article or 
something that had him engaged with XYZ artists. And, and so for me, we also have a responsibility to share this knowledge about all these people, because then, you know, if we don't do that, they'll say it never existed. Just like, you know, the whole talk about the Underground Railroad and quilts being used and that never happened and it didn't happen. And well, and, you know, the the academic types say, Oh, it's, it exactly. didn't happen because it wasn't exactly. documented. Well, some of the well, academic, and that's why I know, of course, you must know Gladys Marie Fry's work. Um, and I was fortunate yes. enough to attend a lecture that she gave up at Monticello. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, and Monticello is Thomas Jefferson's mm-hmm. plantation. And she gave a lecture up there, and she was like, there's a lot of quilt experts who do not want to give black women props for the work that they have done because it's not written down in a journal. I said, you know what? If black people relied on the journals of white people for our history, we would be even more marginalized than we are now. If we relied exclusively on that. Of course, historians have done amazing work dredging up um, illustrations of our humanity, reading between the lines of the records that were kept by um, the enslavers. And yet, you know, of course, when these people are writing these journals, they're always going to put themselves in the best light. You would think that the hardest thing in the world was to be a white woman in the 19th century because of all the slaves they had to manage and how hard it was, um, because that's what they wrote about in their journals. Um, Yeah, but but we did not get a chance to write any things in our journals because they made writing illegal. So, yeah, we can't rely on that. Right. Right. And we weren't, because we weren't allowed to be literate, to document, you know, of course there's, there is oral history and the griot becomes the teller of the story. It's passed down, it's passed down, it's passed down. And so, yes, there are stories. Yes. In modern times, we have the authority within ourselves to document and to publish. We don't have to always wait for um, someone else to give us permission to. We have the authority within our own selves to do the work. We can self-publish. We can um, we can publish online we books. Can su- we can exactly. we do can support podcasts. We can build <laughs> our own infrastructure. And yeah. we don't have to replicate that which has already existed. Because in some ways, those structures that have already existed and and existed for such a long time, they weren't built for us. They weren't built for our success. So why should we replicate them when we could try to build something new on our own? Um, And that's one of the things I love and cherish so much about Harlem Needle Arts. Um, I'm going to take a pause right quick, and we're going to transition a bit to talk more about what does it mean to build a nonprofit organization around this topic. And I'd love to hear more of your thoughts about the difference between Mm -hmm. art and craft when it comes to what one might imagine mattering means in the art world. So y'all stay tuned, hang in there with us, and we'll be back in a bit. Here at Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, we talk a lot about sewing. But if you want to see and not just hear about some of the things we've been discussing, feel free to join us on the socials. You can find us at Stitch Please on Facebook, and you can also find us on Instagram at Black Women Stitch. You can find photos of projects that we've been working on, really interesting social commentary, And on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can join Black Women Stitch for a live Instagram chat. Again, that's every Thursday at 3 p.m. So find us on the socials, follow up with us. We are happy to hear your direct messages. You can reach out to us at the Black Women Stitch page on Instagram, and we'll help you get your stitch together.
Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch. And I am joined today by Michelle Bishop of the Harlem Needle Arts. Um, and she is a, just, just just been so wonderful and so inspiring to talk to. And um, in this next segment, I want to talk more about what you just described when we were off recording about some of the serendipitous moments in your time working with the Harlem Needle Arts. Can you talk about some of those, some of the synergies and things that have kind of come together, things that you might not have been expecting, but that happened anyway? Yes, I, you know, this entire journey has been just a, a number of different serendipitous moments. Like I described earlier with the law student calling me to then have, you know, work with her firm to finish up our um, IRS submission to be a nonprofit organization. And then I think shortly after that, I said, because of course, in New York, being able to have space is at a premium. And at that point, at that stage of the game, it wasn't like we had all these grants or anything. I was just trying to make things happen and make them affordable to the community at large. And I said, oh, well, you know, like working in the libraries because the libraries are free. And then there was the Museum for the City of New York. So I put those on my list and I went to take a workshop, a, a full weekend workshop on crochet at FIT. And I was, you were put into like groups and I was in a group and I was talking to one of the participants and she, and in exchanging who we were and what we did, and she said, oh, well, I work for the Museum for the City of New York. And I oh, could have probably fantastic. fell out of my like, chair you, at that you, point. You do what, where? Please okay. say more. <laughs> right, exactly. And I said, you would not believe that I just wrote down that I wanted to be able to host workshops there. And, and she said, oh, well, you know, we can make that happen. And hence that built a relationship. There have been tons of moments like that. And, um, more recently in, um, I was called by the national black oh theater gosh. here in Harlem. Yes. Um, founded by Barbara Ann Tier. and they were working on a, um, a talk with three, three presenters. I, I was trying to remember all the details. And so they called me because they wanted, they needed a moderator. And so they wanted me to be the moderator. The person they were thinking of was not available. So they called me. So I was the second choice. And I said, sure, you know, well, if we're going to talk about this topic, and I'll tell you more in a minute, let's, let's partner. Let's work together and host this event. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, work with you on distributing to our mailing list and getting the word out and packing the house. And I'll even get someone to videotape it um, and do all of that photography, you know, all the things that we needed to make this a success. And so it happened that the three people who were part of the panel, there was, um, there was a professor from Buffalo State Buffalo, um, SUNY Buffalo, whose name, please forgive me, I can't remember her name. There was the quilt artist Laura Gadsden, who's here in Harlem, and then there was Chief Nike Okundaye. And um, Chief Nike came from Nigeria, she had a long relationship with the National Black Theater, and um, she is an artist, she is a historian, a humanitarian, she is the keeper of all things Adire or at DRA, and I'll talk, share more about that. And so this whole event happened, and she came from Nigeria. So I got to meet her, got to meet her daughter, and we, you would think that we kind of knew each oh, other forever. I love when that happens. But we had just, you, just, you just meet, right. and then you just hit it off. Right. We just hit it off. And so I was there. And then uh, we have a mutual oh, friend and this mutual, right. So this mutual friend has known them all his life. He, she is like his second mother. Okay. And so, and then like all the pieces to who he was came together as well. And so we stayed in touch and chief Nikkei's daughter 
uh, lives here in Brooklyn, and she carried on the tradition of a DRA. And so we got to talking. I said, oh, you should come and teach for us. So she came, she taught. We had a wonderful all-day exhibit learning stitch a DRA. A DRA. And um, the space, we were an organization in residence at uh, the Leroy Neiman Art Center. And in that role, we were there in the space. We had access to the space to host workshops. We partnered to curate exhibits, so on and so forth, and worked together in this community of Harlem to really bring uh, content to the forefront. So when her name is Shay E, Shay E taught, it's a gallery space and a, a workshop space. And she said it would be great to have mom, Chief Nike, come here and exhibit her work. And I paused and I said, let me see how I can make that happen. And what, ha- so I met Shay E months before, months later, she's teaching for us. And a year later, her mother's work is in the gallery. Her mother comes from Nigeria. Chief Nike Okundaye comes, and this event, I, I could have cried, right? Just joy, because first of all, she's a female chief, and she's a female chief because she's so highly revered. And being a woman who was sold into marriages and you know, was one of many wives at a very young age, but she was able to build her own empire where she has four centers in Nigeria. One center is dedicated solely to women and teaching them how to carry on the tradition of Adia Ray. And then she has other locations where she teaches she has a gallery. She teaches industrial design. She is always bringing back to the community. And one of her highest honors is that the Italian government awarded her their highest honor because she went to Italy to help women who were being sexually trafficked. It's on the, wow. Right. So wow. there were a lot of Nigerian women who were brought to Nigeria, excuse me, brought to Italy under false and pretenses. and. Yeah. So she helped and exploited. And so she helped as part of that process. So now all of this being said, in this serendipitous moment and not, you know, not taking advantage of, but building a relationship with the, these creative people around me and making it, you know, curating this highly successful exhibition and workshop because someone said to me, oh, we want you to do this. But then I said, oh, well, let's do this. So we have point A, point B, which turned into C, D, and E, right? And all we, and, and working in community with other people and, and understanding how it benefits yes, all of us. Yes, understanding how. And what I'm hearing and what I love so much about your story is that, you, that it's like every invitation is an opportunity, you know, that every invitation, right. you want to moderate this panel? Sure, I'll moderate this panel, but let's talk about, um, you know, how we can, can we, can we build on this to do more than just me showing up the day of how, like, you know, there's things right. that I know that can benefit you, just like there's things that you know um, that can benefit me. So we can kind of have this exchange of resources and discussion and I can help boost your mm-hmm. audience and you can help boost mine. And that I think is just exactly. a beautiful story about what community can look like and should look like. And that's also like how we build yes, yes. an alternative infrastructure um, to one that's usually just top down that says, I have the power. And if you want it, you need to appeal to me, you know? Um, and I really think that that's one of the things I love about the Harlem Needle Arts Project. Let me ask you a question about what are some of the benefits and risks or limitations of starting, um, making your organization a nonprofit? And I'm asking for strictly personal slash selfish reasons. I've been toying a lot with the idea mm-hmm. about a nonprofit for my group, Black Women Stitch, which I, which is a labor of love. And these women that mm-hmm. I'm connected with um, are just amazing and now lifelong friends. 
And I have heard some fo other folks I've been talking with about like getting grants to build the podcast, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I also live in a place in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is not that big a town that has more nonprofits per capita than anywhere else in the country. We have more nonprofit. We, we, it's Ooh. like we have a nonprofit industrial complex. We've got, it's absolutely <laughs> true. Like, you know, everybody, I mean, I know like, off the top of my head, I can name four people that either founded or currently work at nonprofits. Um, and so what is some of the, what do you see as some of the benefits of having a nonprofit? And more importantly, since your work is so dedicated to centering blackness and black people, does, do you find that you have to compromise some of what you do in order to do this? This is another issue for me on the side. Like, I don't have very many sponsorships. I do partner with different, like, sewing-related organizations. But I'm not sure. I don't know. I guess I, I'm so afraid of having to compromise my message, my tone, my direction in, in exchange for a sponsorship that I just don't want to do. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, that's fine. I'll just be broke. You know, I mean, and so that's what I'm trying to figure out. No. Okay, so let me, okay, so firstly, I never Perfect. compromise anything, okay? I am, this is this is total blackness. This is a total blackness operation. Um, and, and anyone we do business understands that. So I don't compromise anything. I don't alter anything of what, what the ideas that we put forth and what we want to present, I don't alter that for other people. What I will say about being a nonprofit versus a for-profit versus different layers of nonprofit organizations. So there are situations coming out the gate that if you choose to be a nonprofit and become a 501c3 organization, where you can solicit grants, sponsorships and grants are right. two different things. Okay. And so solicit grants from whether it be city, state, federal government and or private foundations and or individuals. Okay. Now that's becoming a 501c3. Like I said, I went through the entire process, filled out all the paperwork, you wait for them to respond, the IRS that is, and they tell you you're in or you're not. Or in some cases, they will come back to you and say, here are a list of questions that we don't understand. We Rep reply to these questions and then we will review them and get back to you. That never happened to us. Sit another <laughs> sermon for this moment, I guess, because I, I was expecting that to happen. And, and, and it's normal. It's a part of the process. Now, there's a different way in which you can register as a nonprofit. And what you're stipulating is that you're working on getting the status. So you register your business as a, the type of business that it is, is a nonprofit business. And then you become, um, you, you seek out fiscal yes. sponsors. So let's say, right. So let's say you're in the process or you're thinking about the process, but you know, um, organization A, who already is a nonprofit, who already is vetted in the in the world, can be your fiscal sponsor. You can apply for funding. The funding goes into their bank account, and they write you the check less That's their right. fee for and being your conduit. And then they handle the taxes okay. and stuff like that too. So like. Well, well, yes, they handle the taxes, right? They handle the taxes. Now, the other being a for-profit, it has to do with what your business plan looks like. What are your goals? And I say business plan because it doesn't matter if you're a nonprofit or a for-profit. <laughs> if you don't have a plan, if you don't treat if you don't treat this like a corporation that it is, don't this is me saying this. I'm not saying the world says this. Do not come into the game. Treat everything like it is business. I don't care if you decide you're going to sell cupcakes on the street. It is a business. What is your business plan to do this? How many cupcakes do you need? How, how much material do you need? How much on an average day? 
What's the best location to sell it? What is the best price? Otherwise, you're going out there blind. You don't have a plan. And you also have to understand that when you become a nonprofit, you're working based on fiscal years of right. whomever the funders are. You're working on delays in money. Uh, they can award you something on paper, but when you may not get the funding until, I don't know, four or five months down the road, but you're still <laughs> expected to be within the time frame right. to present the work that you said you're going to present. Okay. So this is not to deter you. This is to say plan. And the blessing for, for Harlem Needle Arts is in developing. And I, I'm honest to say, even though I had worked in nonprofit, I didn't have to work in the grant area at the time. I worked in fundraising. Oh, I see. But that was fe- different. That was special events fundraising. It was built around the glam and the glitz of an event. It had nothing to do. I could call someone and say, this is happening. These are, this is who's going to be on the bill and how much money you're giving us this year. And they say, we're going to give you $25,000 for a table of 10 people and tickets to the show afterwards and list me as this person. I love you, Mr. Smith. Thank you so much. I will wow. see you at the event. Okay, that's a different type. That's fundraising in a different way. It was around a special event. When I worked for Associated Black Charities, I worked in fun in their fun with their fundraising event. I did marketing for them, but I never had to write grants for them. So there's there were lots of things that I did not know that I learned. And one of the things for me is that I forced myself to be able to learn the governmental money process first. That is the hardest. That's the one with all the bureaucracy. That's all the paper pushing that if you can get through that part of it, then you are able to go then to corporate funders, individuals, foundations, because they see you have a track record. Everything, every, all public money is public knowledge. So if you go online right now to New York City and look up Harlem Needle Arts, you're going to see who gave us what money. It's not private information. I work now for New York, right? We we work for New York. But you see, when I write a grant, I'm telling you who I am. Now, if you don't if you don't feel our mission represents or our content represents who you want, you know, how you want to fund, that's up to you. But I, I do not, I don't sacrifice who we are. I do look at partnerships. I look at how we reach, how do you reach different bodies yes. within the community? How do you do you, how did you, how do you dispel myths about this world of needle arts? Oh, my grandmother exactly. used to do it. Oh, black people don't do that. Why would I, buy, why would I quilt when I can go to, I'm not going to call any, I can go to the store and buy oh a, a bed in yes. a bag. I've heard oh my that gosh. I'm like, you know what? Times. Please stop and talking to me about this because I am certainly not going to make you anything for the same price as a bed in a bag. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? I, you know, I also imported at one point in my entrepreneurial world, um, uh, home accessories from Senegal had traveled there and built a relationship. And one, you know, one of the things that but part of my responsibility also yes. is to educate people. Because they don't have, at this very moment, we are in a pandemic. And the cottage industry that's keeping people alive is thriving right now. All the stuff that was grandma stuff, actually, it was not grandma stuff solely. It was people who did those things from the the youngest of age throughout their lives. And we should not stigmatize. I don't understand how some folks, they, they seem to reject um, certain heritage when they say, oh, this is not your grandma's quilt block or this is not your mama's crochet pattern. And I'm like, why yeah. wouldn't you want your grandma's quilt block? And why wouldn't you want your mama's crochet pattern? Right. It's only because they are older women. We dismiss them and say that it's, not, it's no good anymore. It's really just right. a, another form of those types of right. biases and hierarchies that shape the way we approach so much of our lives, unfortunately. And you're undoing that. 
Right. Right. And, you, and, and you, we have to understand the value in our traditions, right? Now, our, yes, you can take a tradition and cre- create a contemporary spin on it. That, of course, you can certainly do that. But understand the origin of why we work with our hands. Understand the fact that, you know, I know a couple of entities right now who are able to secure contracts with the city of New York to make the things that PPEs need. Yes, me too. Right? So this is happening all over the country. Now, these are people who, of course, they've had other professions. This is part of who they are. We're not just one way we're not we're, we, we are have not many just dimensions one way i to, love that right. that is we are multi-dimensional people we have different ways in which we can exist in this world and as a suggestion to the world we should have different avenues that are more internal more about who we are than just about who we are serving in the world And I don't say that, but when I say serving, meaning just going to a nine to five job and coming home, right? We, 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 yes, we're, we actually are working for ourselves in a way because we're working because we need, we're not just working because the other person And that's why for me, I I, I know some people use uh, the phrase selfish sewing. They say, oh, I'm going to do some selfish sewing mm -hmm. this weekend. And I reject that term entirely. I call it self-care sewing. Because when I get to sit down at my sewing machine, yeah. it's not about the students that I teach doing my regular job. It's not about any demands that a committee or somebody is asking of me. This is something that I am doing because I love it and because there's something about the transformation and the sitting down and the stitching and the sometimes the unstitching and the cutting and all that requires to make a garment or to make a quilt or to make some piece um, is doing something for my spirit. Um, and that's why I never right. call it selfish sewing. And instead I say self-care sewing because this is a time when I'm prioritizing right. my needs, um, which is not something that we are, as, right. as Black women in particular, get encouraged to do very often. That's true. And and we have and to yeah, I'd love to talk Mondays. about that. Please tell me more. Thank Y'all you. need to check out these Mantra Mondays. They've got a lot of them. I know that you, you started doing them um, way before this pandemic hits, but now you can access them on Zoom. Can you tell yeah. us about it? Yes. Yeah, Mantra Mondays. I created a time every Monday or almost every Monday where no matter what you're working on, whatever handwork or artwork, we would gather most recently before this at the Harlem Y, come into the space and you would work on your project some, there's music in the background. You're in community with other people. You may learn something from what the other person is doing. Occasionally, we would have guest speakers like we've had on you know the Zooms that you've listened into. And it, I say to, in, in promoting it, give yourself permission to create. And that's because we don't necessarily make time to have to do something for ourselves to be creative. And yes, this, you know, I can't talk about it enough about what this time is forcing us to do. And it's sad that we have to be in this place that something has driven us to a place to stop for those who can stop, you know, to, to reflect on, well, what is it really that gives me joy in my life? Right. What creative outlets do I have? Um, I used to do X, Y, and Z when I was growing up. Why did I stop? Why don't I have a sewing machine in my home? Why don't, well, I could, I, I remember how to sew. I could be, you know, making masks for those in need. There, there's so many factors, but we have Mantra Mondays. It's Monday, the beginning of the week, where most of us don't ever want to get out of bed <laughs> like, on a Monday. Like, here we go, go again. Your job. That's the People probably think, why would you do it on a Monday? No, why not a Friday? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Start your Monday off right. Start your Monday evening from six to eight doing so that you're refreshed, you're invigorated, so that you can get through the rest of the week. And also because we are a commuter 
environment. You know, when people get on the bus or train, they carry, you know, their handwork with them, their knitting, their crochet, even some people spin in public. Um, there are there, there are things that give you that temporary moment of just yes. wusa or calm. And, and so, and it also keeps you on point in a way, because when you come back to the next Mantra Monday, that's when we're face to face, you want to show what you've completed. You, there's a sense in all of this. I've always said in all of the different aspects of creating, there is a sense of pride that one has within themselves that says, wow, I did this. You know, I made the rules surrounding how this piece is going to come out. Yes, there are some people who work with patterns. Some people alter patterns. We try to encourage people to actually alter patterns. You know, look at things differently. Look at a different color, add different colors, because that's who the aesthetic of who we are is more colorful. And so that's what Mantra Monday is. The, the mantra is all of the art forms. Quilting, knitting, crochet, spinning, batik, adire or adiare, um, weaving, fiber fusion, tatting, all of those beading, all of those art forms are considered rhythmic because it's a continuous repetitive stitching or connecting. So they're considered rhythmic art forms. And rhythmic art forms are, studies have been shown, create calm in one, helps people to focus, especially young people, helps young people with math. It creates a state where you, the mantra of the sti stitch, the repetitive nature of the stitch, similar to like a yoga, keeps you in a place of calm and stillness. And you could pick up an item and start working on it. And the next thing you know, it's three o'clock in the morning. That's that's true. why I love handwork, right? I love handwork. I love hand quilting. I'll piece together by machine, but I love hand quilting. But um, so that's what Mantra Mondays is all about for, for you know, bringing people that's together. That's a really beautiful story. And it's a wonderful point on which to end. I think that I'm going to forever, rem I'm going to ever, for I'm going to forever remember rhythmic, arts or a rhythmic form because I'm not a big hand sewer. I, you know, I can knit to save my life. Um, I cannot crochet to save my life, but I could knit to save my life. But, and I, I know like when I was doing a lot of knitting, the clicking of the needles, you know, that just felt so good. And even now mm -hmm, with, with mm -hmm. my sewing machine, it's funny because when I created this, the theme song for this podcast, the opening sound, the opening bars of the song are my sewing machine. I recorded the sound of my sewing nice. machine sewing and I built the layers of the song that I composed around that sound. Because, and so like when you say rhythmic mm -hmm. or a, rhythm, uh, um, a rhythmic art form, I'm like, oh my gosh, it is. And it can be kind of, you know, hypnotic and can kind of bring you into this state of peace. And although I don't hand sew or hand do a lot of hand work, there have been moments when I look up and it's three o'clock in the morning. Um, and I did not have the intention of being up that late because you get so into it and you sink into the process so much. So Michelle Bishop, I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. Is there anything you want to tell us about the next steps for Harlem Needle Arts? Like what are your next big projects on the horizon and how people can find you on social media to get more information about what you're doing? Sure. Currently, we have two projects that are in um, are out in the world. One, we have a public art installation which commemorates the documented 400 years of enslaved Africans um, that came to this country, and we are honoring the resilience, uh, determination, and the, just the overall fortitude of African diasporic people to to, to survive and thrive. And that's, we pay honor to the sacrifices that they made for us to be here today. So we honor them. And that's in, um, that's at Colonel Young Triangle Park in Harlem. You can go to our website and find out that information. The other project that is in 
it's completed, um, but the pandemic has postponed it. So it will be uh, on, once it launches, it will be on exhibit for six months. And that is called the Legacy Quilt. And it's part of uh, the exhibition, which is curated by Dr. Jessica Harris for the Museum of Food and Drink. It will be on exhibit at the Africa Center in Harlem. And it, the exhibit is called African slash American Making the Nation's Table. And what the quilt is 14 oh feet gosh. by 30 feet. Yeah, there's one that's 14 feet by 30 feet. The other one is 22 feet by nine feet. The first quilt, which is called the Legacy Quilt, has 400 different quilt blocks. Each quilt block is honoring the 400 different either inventions, uh, farmers, agricultural specialists, inventors, I said that, chefs, um, people who have been a part of the landscape uh, of America and food. And there are 400 different narratives within it, 400 different stories, but there's so many more. But the number 400 was around the commemoration. um, commemoration. Yeah, that's wonderful. Right. Exactly. And and also they resurrected the Ebony (gasps) Test Kitchen, which is part of. Yes. Yeah, that was going to be from what I understand, I think it was going to be it was auctioned off and they got the original test kitchen that John Johnson had in his building. And a test kitchen is where chefs come and test out different recipes and products. And they, you know, serve people within the Johnson publication um, building. And so the, they, the entire original kitchen is on exhibit. Um, what else is there? That So there's a lot of history about, how we have, as African people in this country contributed yes. to food and, and, yes. and still are contributing. And the, the number of inventions, it's just phenomenal. And you see the landscape, sorry, you see the landscape of, um, you see the landscape of how we were able thrive. to survive and thrive. Just thrive. And so much of what we are, what this country is, of course, is because of, of African, that is the African truth. people. So, yeah. So, and we will be, lastly, we will amplify the amount of public art installations that we have as we are, that was already part of the plan before the prior pandemic, but more importantly now to give public spaces art and yes. creativity. Yes. Well, Michelle Bishop, thank you so much for speaking with me today. This has been really a delight and a treat. Um, I will be sure to include in the show notes uh, much of the information that you have given me uh, and so that folks, you can go to the show notes and find out more information and get on the Harlem Needle Arts uh, mailing list. I'm on that list. Some great stuff comes through there. So Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you for having me and stay well, same. stay safe. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. There are a variety of ways that you can support the program and you're doing it right now. By listening, to the pro- by listening to the podcast, it does help us grow. Another way to do that is to rate the podcast, review it, subscribe to it. All of these things are ways that you can support the podcast without having to spend any money at all. If you would like to spend some money to support us, there are ways to do that as well. You can make direct donations to our Patreon site for monthly contributions, as well as one-time contributions to PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo. And finally, we have another cute, very adorable way for you to support the Black Women's Stitch Project. It's a pin, a P-I-N enamel lapel pin that's very cute. It's about two inches wide and one and a half inch tall, and it's of the Black Women's Stitch logo. 
and that is $15 with free shipping to the U.S. And so if you drop $15 in the a PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App accounts, and then send me your email, no, not email, if you send me your mailing address to my email, either at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com, or you send me a direct message on the Black Women Stitch Instagram page, we will put the pin in the mail to you. Um, again, free shipping, $15 for the pin, and all of this goes to support the Black Women's Stitch Project. Thank you again for joining us this week. Come back next week, and we will help you get your stitch together. 